My name is Rudy Agovic. Uh, I'm based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, um, as of late, I've been uh, helping a lot of organizations with large language models from small organizations all the way to large organizations. So a lot of what I have to say is based on practical experience. Um, for today, I opted uh, to choose the topic of uh, reasoning using large language models. And so, yeah, let's uh, uh, dive into it. So today we're going to be talking about uh, reasoning using large language models. So we'll start out um, in addressing, you know, why um, this is an important topic. Uh, we'll, we'll cover uh, a definition of reasoning, and then uh, we'll have a brief overview of lar large language models, and then we will dive um, into where large language models do well when it comes to reasoning, where they fail. Um, what kinds of ways are there to evaluate them? And then we'll talk about ongoing research out there uh, to improve uh, the reasoning capabilities within large language models. All right. So uh, yeah, before we dive into um, any deeper, I, uh, one thing I just wanted to, to emphasize is that this isn't necessarily kind of a clear cut topic. Um, it is something that is confusing to business stakeholders. And it is something that tends to be confusing to some practitioners as well. Um, for business stakeholders, um, it's confusing because they get approached by people that are promising them the blue from the sky when it comes to generative AI. And a lot of people are not even aware that reasoning is a thing that you, know, you should be concerned about. You know, like they've heard that they could hallucinate, but in terms of you know, the inferences that are, you know, being made, uh, there's kind of an assumption that, you know, that is just kind of intelligent and it will do it for you. That's for some of the non-technical business stakeholders. And so I try to emphasize the importance of this topic. Now, when it comes to the people that are actually in the field, <clears throat> they're also a bit divided on this topic. You have a group of people that are, you know, will categorically deny that large language models are doing any reasoning. And I'll, no, not all of them are just doing that blindly. There is evidence that they use to do that. And then there's another group of people that, you know, believes that large language models are kind of like one step away from a general artificial intelligence. And then there's a third group of people that is actually doing the research and they're looking at this in a more measured way and trying to understand where are the gaps and how could we improve. So uh, yeah, uh, going into this, I just wanted to kind of emphasize that, um, you know, it, it's not something that, you know, like my title says reasoning using large language models, but what I really want to you know, explore within this uh, uh, webinar is, you know, this topic of, of are they actually reasoning? And if they are reasoning, you know, where could you use them for that? And if there are gaps, are they being addressed? That's really kind of the idea. So reasoning is really important because it's important for problem solving, but it's also important for very practical applications. And you think of large language models nowadays, you know, there's agents that are being used to kind of automate tasks, automate multiple tasks. Well, what that entails is taking a more complicated task and breaking it down into sub pieces, which you then address. And that, again, involves reasoning. So if you have a large language model that is incapable of do doing this kind of reasoning, then your agents are not going to be reliable. The other area where this becomes you know, really important is um, for businesses that are contemplating to deploy large language models. Because, well, if you think of it, um, you know, vector databases, um, um, augmented uh, kind of retrieval is, um, you know, is becoming more popular where, uh, and I have an image of this here, where, you know, like you start out with a prompt and you go into a vector database, you retrieve relevant documents, and then you present those relevant documents to the large language model along with your question. Well, here's the thing. If your large language model is not consistent in its reasoning or is not capable of reasoning, you have no guarantees that the large language model will pick out just the right things out of those documents or that it will make the right 
conclusions. So that's why this topic is, is, is really important, uh, is, um, you know, to kind of understand where the failure modes and if you, you know, it, it, this is not, not a big deal if you're using an application that's kind of internal and that can handle some errors. But if it's something that's client facing, you know, if you're retrieving regulations uh, and you know things of that nature and presenting that to a client, then you know you need to be really careful. So that's why this is a really important topic, and it's also one that you know is not really clear cut. And we'll get into the details of that, you know, as we as we go through this presentation. So before we get going, let's define reasoning. Um, and the reason I'd like to define that is because when I see discussions happening around the, this topic is frequently people kind of end up using maybe slightly different definition of what reasoning means to them. And so then the entire discussion ends up being kind of meaningless because, you know, their core assumptions differ. And so it's really good to have one common definition. Um, and so Let's just, um, you know, like this is one that you could find easily out there in literature. Um, so reasoning is the process of thinking about something in a logical and systematic way, using evidence and past experiences to reach a conclusion or make a decision. Uh, reasoning involves making inferences, composing multiple steps of inferences, um, evaluating arguments, drawing logical conclusions based on available information. That's kind of reasoning for you. Now, the thing is, even with this definition, uh, there is multiple things that fall under reasoning. And so let's go into that in a bit more detail. So specifically, you know, there's uh, one uh, sub area of reasoning called deductive reasoning. So with deductive reasoning, you're starting out with a general statement to reach a specific logical conclusion. So you'll have like premise or premises, and then there's a conclusion if the premises are true and your argument is true, you can conclude that the conclusion is true. And here we have a premise called all humans are mortal. Rudy is a human. So the conclusion is Rudy is mortal. Now, what I've ended up doing here is I've just taken this and thrown it into chat GTP, uh, you know, just to kind of illustrate the output you get. Um, so here I, I modified this slightly to be a bit more, even more, more nonsensical. So Assume all humans are Star Trek fans. Rudy is a human. What can you conclude about Rudy? And you can see that it seems to be applying these rules for deductive reasoning. And, you know, it en ends up with the conclusion that you would expect. Now, does this mean it knows how to reason? Well, we don't know yet. It seems to be uh, doing something. So now let's move on. In addition to deductive reasoning, there is also something called inductive reasoning. And with inductive reasoning, uh, conclusions are drawn from observations and evidence. And a conclusion with inductive reasoning is likely to be true, but it's not certain to be true. So for instance, you know, like in this example, we have an observation that you know every wizard we've seen wore a hat. And then the observation is that Gandalf is a wizard. So a conclusion would be Gandalf likely wears a hat. Now, We've not stated here that we have seen Get Gandalf, so that's why it's likely, and we can't conclude for certain that Gandalf or Sahak. Now, again, I've put this into Chat GTP. This is a very like the simplest example you can think of. Um, and uh, yeah, when we do that, um, well, again, I tell it to assume every wizard you know uh, we've seen or had Gandalf is a wizard. What can we conclude about Gandalf? Now, it concludes that Gandalf wears a hat. Not likely, it wears a hat. So in it, down there, it says, however, it's worth noting that the conclusion is based on inductive reasoning. So somehow it knows that it should be inductive reasoning, but it's not applying it correctly. So even with this simple example, we've already hit or something that seems to be breaking. Um, I asked it, you know, well, I suggested whether maybe it should be likely and then it corrects itself. I mean, this kind of correction doesn't really mean a whole lot with chat GTP. If you've used it, you know that it kind of correct itself into anything if you, you know, suggest it long enough. Um, but um, 
Yeah, so this is inductive reasoning, you know, another uh, uh, subcategory of reasoning. And then we have abductive reasoning. And here, um, again, conclusions are drawn from observations and evidence, but here the conclusion is based on the best explanation based on the evidence. So an example would be the washer is not working and there's water in front of it. So conclusion would be the most likely explanation is that there's, the washer is broken. So that's an example of abductive reasoning. You know, the, the whole takeaway from this is there are different types of reasoning. You don't necessarily have to memorize all of this. So moving on, beyond these three very common types of reasoning, um, there's more. So we have analogical reasoning here. Um, analogical reasoning is based on comparisons. Now well, there's causal reasoning that's based on cause and effects of events. And then there is probabilistic reasoning that's based on likelihood, uh, uh, likelihood of outcomes. So, um, you know, like the point here being, there's a lot of different types of reasoning. So <clears throat> moving on, in addition to all these different types of reasoning, there's also a distinction between formal reasoning and informal reasoning. So if you know, as an undergraduate, you took a computer science class, you know, uh, computer science or math or any kind of a technical field, you probably have been exposed to this, you know, uh, these letters and symbols you're seeing here in front of you. Um, this is called first order logic. And um, first order logic is basically all of it is about deductive reasoning. So you have the premises on one side, and then you have the conclusion on the other side. And these are kind of rules in uh, you know, first order logic. Uh, now, the formal way to express this, you know, is even more uh, rigorous than what you have in here. But, you know, like my point being is that, you know, like there is, there is a way to symbolically express this. And, you know, we all know about mathematical reasoning that's also a lot about symbols. But then there's a, an, an informal version of reasoning, which is what we use day to day, uh, kind of, based on intuition, beliefs, that is a bit more loose, uh, less structured, and also less re re reliable than, you know, more formal version of reasoning. Um, so after going through all of this, the question is really, if we're looking at large language models, well, what kind of reasoning matters then? You know, what, what, do, what should we be looking for? Is it all of these things? You know, if we're trying to assess whether these things can do reasoning, so here, the point is that there isn't really an agreed upon definition for you know, the context of large language models. So, you know, like if you look within the community that's doing research, they're trying to, to come up with a unified way of how they should express the type of reasoning that's relevant for large language models. And some of them are looking across the board. Um, some of them will emphasize and say, okay, we're going to be focusing on informal deductive reasoning. Now, that's where, you know, already some issues can arise because there might be folks that, you know, like don't consider the loose notion of informal reasoning, even reasoning. And so um, that's really important to understand if somebody's talking about reasoning, you know, what is it that they're after? And then we have, you know, mathematical and abstract reasoning. That's obviously also, you know, quite important and relevant. And then we have multi-step logical reasoning, which we've already kind of hinted at as being important for, you know, multi-step reasoning that an agent would do. Moving on. Um, so now we're going to briefly review large language models and, and kind of touch upon how that fits into this context of, um, of uh, reasoning. And this is something I've discussed in previous webinars, so I'm not going to go deep into it. But basically, um, a large language model is based on an architecture called uh, called uh, transformers, transformer architecture. Um, it has an input that's a sequence of words. Um, the inputs, you know, like the model itself has multiple modules to it. One is an encoder, one is a decoder. The encoder creates a numeric representation of the text that's coming in, kind of like a vector, a list of numbers, if you will. Now, the encoding is utilized in a decoder to generate the output. And you can see that there's like a target box in here. So the target, the way that the output is generated is you start off with a very special tag called start, 
you give it to the decoder and then that will generate the first word. So here we have the sentence, who is the King of England? And that will generate Charles. And then in the next step, I take Charles and I append it to the target. So I keep adding the outputs into the input here so that I get generate, you know, I can generate the next word. That's how large language models are generating all these responses. They do it word by word. The point here is that large language models in their most basic form are trained to basically generate the most plausible sentence that follows some previous sentence. They, you know, like, like they're not, you know, any, they're not doing anything beyond that. Now, but that it is incorrect to say that they're just kind of statistical parrots that generate language because the reality of it is this isn't where the training of large language models stops. You know, a lot of these companies that are investing in them, they're gathering a lot of prompt response pairs, data that they feed into these models. And so when you are feeding this in, into, into these models, you know, you're teaching the models in essence about things that go beyond just what's the next sentence. And so you're infusing knowledge. And, you know, when you have a space that's, you know, a, a trillion parameters or billions of parameters, it's not so easy to, you know, visualize what kind of information this model is capturing. Now, one thing that is worth emphasizing here is that nobody is explicitly training these models to be able to reason. So they're, they're being trained to respond to questions. Uh, but if we're talking about logical reasoning and how you infer things from, you know, premise and an argument, like nobody is explicitly teaching the model to do that. And yet we're asking ourselves, you know, is it reasoning? Well, because we are suspecting that something is happening and, and it's actually interesting that something is happening because it's not something that it was trained to. So moving on, um, let's touch upon, um, you know, where, and I will do this briefly and then dive into it a, a bit uh, deeper. Uh, so where do large language models work well? This started out with a paper um, on emerging properties of large language models. And that paper came out, it was a bit controversial because you know, there, there was discussion on whether these capabilities are truly emerging or not. But basically the observation was that once we pass about 100 billion parameters, they start performing really well on a number of tasks, like including arithmetic, you know, there's like a, a variety of different benchmarks where suddenly you know, they have really good performance. Um, and yeah, I think this discussion of whether that happens suddenly or not is not really that relevant. Uh, the point is that uh, you know, some of these benchmarks are reasoning related and they seem to be doing well on those that benchmarks. And so then the question is, how, how are they doing this? How are they capable of doing it? And then, um, yeah, it's not just within that one paper, you know, generally across benchmarks for reasoning, you know, there's, there's been, you know, pretty good performance and there's, there's a number of use, use cases or examples that one can name, like for instance, um, you know, the, they're getting a, you know, 90th percentile performance on the bar exam, 93rd percentile performance on SAT reading exam, and 89th percentile on the SAT math exam. Uh, and then there's a, a bunch of anecdotal examples as well, where, you know, like just recently there was a lady, lady whose son, uh, you know, she was basically writing about that or her son had some kind of a condition and seen like 17 different doctors and nobody could say what was going on with him. So she took all the medical notes and, and put it into chat GTP and it came up with a recommendation for a diagnosis. And so, she took that to, to the doctor and it turned out that her son had that. So that was kind of a pretty interesting story. It's, it's an anecdotal example, but when you take all this together, you know, you could say, uh, well, you know, you, you may wonder if, you know, you're looking at is why would somebody think that these models are not capable of reasoning? And so we will dive into that as to why that might be, because looking at this, that's pretty impressive. You know, if you, you look at this list, they appear to be 
you know, doing something that looks like reasoning and they're, they're, they're solving some problems really well. So those are the strengths. Uh, now, when it comes to, you know, areas where they don't work so well, um, so kind of the, the weaknesses, um, one weakness is multi-step reasoning. So if, um, you know, we have a multi-step process that needs to be broken down um, into, you know, like kind of a, a more, a, a smaller uh, um, uh, uh, pro sub problems and then addressing those. And I have, I've mentioned this now multiple times with the, the agents. Um, so that's one area uh, where they don't do very well. One area is out of sample or out of, dis uh, out of distribution uh, reasoning. And what that means is if you're trying to, to reason about things that were not seen in the training data, they don't do very well. Um, and then there's something called the reversal curse. We'll talk about that in a moment. And they're also not that great in abstract reasoning. So these are, um, these are all kind of issues. Uh, now we're going to dive a bit deeper into where this is coming from. Um, and so we understand you know, like where the weaknesses really are. And if somebody's thinking about using large language models in their business, to kind of be aware of that. Um, so, but, you know, as I mentioned, there are people out there uh, that are questioning whether these things are truly reasoning. So I have created here one example, toy example to illustrate, uh, you know, some of what we just discussed. Um, my toy example is, uh, you know, for multi-step reasoning. I created a board that's five by five, has letters on, um, on the rows on, from top to bottom and uh, numbers from left to right. Um, the letter M indicates mouse, the letter C indicates cheese, the axes indicate boxes that are not penetrable. Uh, now, is this an example I derived from another bigger example on the web? Um, now here, the question to the model is, what is the shortest path for the mouse to get to the cheese? And if you ask that, you're going to find that it will give you a path that's not legal, that's not valid. So it, it, even though it was told that, um, you know, like it should not be possible to take diagonal steps, it took a diagonal step to get to the cheese. And it's not recognizing that in this case, it's not possible to get to the cheese. So this is a, you know, like a very simple example I constructed, but you can imagine if you had an agent that goes out you know, on the web and you're telling it automate these three things to me. And by the way, when you're done, uh, email my boss or uh, my prospective client. Um, yeah, you may be surprised at the end of the day what you get, uh, or, or rather you shouldn't be surprised what, what you get with that. Uh, so you, know, you want to be, a multi-step reasoning is definitely an area where there's a lot of potential for automation, uh, but it's also an area that you know needs to be handled with care. For this reason, you know, this is like a toy example. Moving forward, uh, so uh, the reverse uh, curse that I mentioned before, I just wanted to highlight what this is about. So there is a recent paper where you know they were observing that if the model was trained on a statement that goes something like A is B, it is not going to know that B is A. And so they were giving this example of, you know, who is Tom Cruise's mother? And then you get the answer, Mary Lee Pfeiffer. And then they asked, who is Mary Lee's Pfeiffer's son? And the model doesn't know. Uh, now, if you take this exact same question and you put it into GPT for now, it, it will answer it correctly. So. I don't know, they've probably done something in the meantime to address this, but the points that the paper that this paper makes are valid because they didn't just look at these anecdotal examples, they created kind of um, a data set with fake, um, fake facts and they tuned the model with that. And then they looked at, you know, whether the model would be able to answer, you know, uh, so if, if here the question is, uh, you know, um, if the answer is A is B, that they can get to B is A. And what they found is that um, 
it's not able to do it. So what this kind of hints at or tells you is that the um, reasoning is very sensitive to what's in the training data and it's to be and it seems to be sensitive to the direction in which things are expressed so it seems like for the model to know both of these things it's not going to kind of reason that b is a you have to have that in your training data so that it knows it was well, kind of interesting but um you know like think about your documents your legal documents you just thrown out there to the model and it needs to reason um you know like this would be something that a human would know um so you know, another thing to you know kind of keep in mind all right <clears throat> so let's get to evaluation so in this section i kind of summarize various ways in which um reasoning in large language models has been evaluated to better understand you know, like in a, in a sort of impartial way without any of these kind of, because some of these people get emotional about, are they reasoning, are they not reasoning? You know, let's just kind of look at the evidence and see what's going on. And, um, and this is helpful, you know, even if there are gaps, if you're, you know, trying to uh, fill those gaps and understand, you know, how to address them, it's helpful to know, you know, where they are. So no, when it comes to evaluation, the first thing I would say is, you can think of kind of three different, and there's more than three, but you can think of at least three different categories of evaluation that would be relevant. One would be, what is the answer, the end result? And that would be like, I ask a question, I get the answer. And so when I'm evaluating, I'm just looking, did I get the result? Um, now, um, there's, but that's one way of doing it. Now, um, there are two additional aspects about um, evaluation that are relevant. One is faithfulness. Uh, and so what does that mean? That here the question is, are you actually following the reasoning steps? Are you applying reasoning to get to the answer? And you can kind of think about your high school days, you know, when you were taking a math class, I, I bet you had a teacher that would tell you, you know, like, this is how much you get for the answer. And this is how much you get for showing your work. You have to show how you got there. And so the question here is, can the model show how it got there? And it's, it's as a way to understand, is it actually applying reasoning? Or is it using some kind of uh, another map to go from input to output that doesn't involve necessarily reasoning uh, reasoning uh, uh, capabilities or, or you know, uh, um, rules. Um, so um, the third one that I have in here is out of sample robustness. That is relevant if, you know, you're thinking about, you know, if you're thinking about leveraging the reasoning capability of large language models, are they going to be reliable when I show them something that they have not seen before? Uh, and so that's a relevant category. Unfortunately, well, it's not true across the board, but at least up until recently, the vast majority of the benchmarks for testing reasoning capabilities has been number two, where you're just looking at the answer. And, you know, like this includes things like that bar exam and the, the things where, you know, it did really great. Um, it did really great, but even though it did really great, it is not yet a proof that it's actually faithful to the reasoning that it's you know it's scoring high on number one, because it could found it could have found some kind of a heuristic. There might be something in the features that you know tie the output to the input, uh, where it's not even necessary to know reasoning to get that. Um, so that's kind of the the state of things. Now, more recently, there's been a lot of work in this area about you know improving reasoning capabilities and understanding reasoning capabilities. And so uh, researchers have put an effort in to kind of, you know, look at a more holistic picture. Um, the first one that I would like to mention is um, it's called reasoning or reciting, um, is a, a paper that kind of tries to assess whether large language models are actually doing reasoning or if they're just memorizing stuff. 
or memorizing things, um, or memorizing is another word for over overfitting. <clears throat> so this is kind of an interesting paper. Um, let me zoom in, zoom in here. So um, they've looked at various different um, use cases, um, you know, different benchmarks for things like arithmetic, code execution, code generation, basic syntax, and logic. And what it did is, you know, they came up with sort of a default set of questions, let's say for, um, for code, um, code generation in, in Python. You know, so there's a basic set of questions. And then they wanted to create an alternate data set that was kind of shifted in some way but not completely foreign to the model. So for instance, here um, in, in the Python example, they, um, they change it to be in, you know, the, the arrays to be one indexed and not zero indexed. And so that's a pretty small change. If you're able to generate code in your, you know, like you understand the reasoning around code generation, this is, should be something that doesn't throw you off you know, too much. Now in arithmetic, what they did is they went from base 10 to base nine under the assumption that a lot of the reasoning around arithmetic remains the same, even though you've changed the base. Um, so they call this counterfactual. Uh, uh, so the, 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 the full, the, you know, like the original one, they call the default world and these modified data sets, they call them the counterfactual world. And what they're trying to assess for this is really, um, you know, it, it's kind of like a proxy way to, to see whether the type of reasoning that these models are doing is abstract. You know, like if they're capturing arithmetic, are they remembering that one plus one is two? Or are they remembering, you know, more generic rules about arithmetic and the same thing about code generation you know like at what level of ab abstraction is this happening and you'll find that there are some people out there that will say that being able to abstract is a requirement to be able to say that you're reasoning so that's kind of you know like the question here what you see at the top are um you know basically the comparison um in performance between the default world and the counterfactual world. The blue one is the default, the orange is the counterfactual, the little dotted lines, that's random performance. And so what you're going to see here is across the board, when you go to this counterfactual uh, world, the performance drops. So the models are not capable of, um, um, the, the models are not capable of, um, of extracting some kind of abstract rules that carry over to the counterfactual world. That's the observation. Um, yeah, I'm not really getting into, um, you know, like whether the large language models should be, you know, like whether that even should be a requirement. Um, I can just, I'm just saying this because I've literally read papers that you know like are dismissing um, that large language models are doing re reasoning based on the fact that based on like papers like this where they're showing oh you, you know like the, the rules don't you know like the rules that are being extracted they don't seem to be that abstract um, and um, yeah so that's um, that that would be. Um, the uh, reasoning or, yeah, that would be the first set. The second set is, uh, you know, another, uh, you know, collection of use case uh, or uh, benchmarks for spatial drawing, spatial reasoning, drawing, chord fingering on a guitar, note uh, melod in melody, like, you know, they're shifting basically where the note is playing. And the question is, can you reason? Um, uh, whether or not a move is legal in chess, where the, the, the figures have just been kind of placed in different positions. That's why they consider, you know, like if you have learned the rules of chess in, you know, more generic fashion, you should be able to reason about one or the other. Same thing with the notes. And that's kind of what they're trying to get at. 
Um, and um, yeah, across the board, there's a, a decline in performance. In some cases, like the chess case, the decline goes almost to random. So it gets, um, it gets really bad. Uh, a similar thing with the spatial um, uh, reasoning. Um, and there's, you know, like this first example was just looking at GPT-4. There's another set of images where they look at across the different models um, for, for different models. And you can kind of see that this finding is consistent. It's just that, you know, some of the other models are really bad to begin with for some of these tasks, like the chess move, you could see, you know, like these here are not performing very well at all. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, let's see here. Then got arithmetic and code execution. Um, and yeah, in, in some of these, it's really extreme, kind of the drop off when you compare, this is GPT 3.5, um, when, you, when you compare, this is base, base 10 versus base nine. And GPT-4 is, you know, doing significantly better. You know, like there's, you could tell there's improvement when it comes to arithmetic here. Um, so, you know, like the, you know, looking at this, um, the authors kind of basically note that there's a consistent gap between the default and the counterfactual. Um, it seems like large language models work well for task specific reasoning. So, you know, like, yeah, they're, they're doing great on these um, exams that they've been trained on, you know, like 90% performance. If, you know, you're gonna be passing bar exams all day long, you know, like that, there's, there's utility in that, you know, you train it for that specific purpose and it does well. And, you know, if you're talking about business applications, that makes sense, you know, it, does, it doesn't mean this is a lost cause for business applications, as long as you're, targeting, a, uh, you know, a task specific thing. Um, and they're, you know, kind of claiming that the reasoning in uh, the default worlds is overfit and memorized because they're not seeing this sort of more generic reasoning. Um, I think, um, so this is just my two cents on top of their kind of conclusions here. If you think about even much simpler models, and I've mentioned this in my previous webinars, like word to vec this is a model that came out a long time ago that is, is not considered a large language model, but it's capturing a numeric representation of words. In this word to vec representation, if you take king and subtract queen from it, it's the same as taking man and subtracting woman from it. Now, you'd say, you know, you can say that the words king and queen are used in a similar fashion as man and woman, but the interesting thing is that that's not just the difference between the two, it's also if you take king and you subtract man out of king and then add woman to that, you you end up with queen. So that's very interesting. Uh, even though this word to vec model is very simple, it seems to be capturing this concept of gender just from how words are being used. Now, if a simple model like word to vec is capable of capturing this kind of a abstract concept. The question is, what is a large language model capable of doing? Uh, and I think that's an interesting question. So I would say it's very likely that, you know, there are certain abstract concepts that a large language model is capable of extracting and learning. Uh, now, based on the paper that we've discussed, uh, it's not capable of reasoning in an abstract fashion, uh, but that is not really surprising. It was not trained to do reasoning. And if it is able to capture some abstract concepts, the question is if you trained it to do more abstract reasoning, like if that was the task you trained it on, um, how much better could it do? So the second one here I have is called evaluating the logical reasoning ability of ChatGTP and uh, GPT-4. This is another evaluation paper. The first one was looking at abstract reasoning and trying to get a sense for whether that's happening or not. The second one, um, the second one is looking at out of distribution reasoning. So it's not not simple to set up these use cases where you know you have uh, 
training data and then points that are outside. And here they have specifically two data sets. This ARL set is some kind of a legal data set. And then Logic QA is a, some kind of a data set from China on service. Uh, I don't remember the exact details of it, but the point of it being is these two data sets uh, are out of distribution. And so you're know, looking at this, uh, so that's what the, you know, for this one here, that's what the OOD means. So Logic QA has a version that's out of the distribution and one that's not. Um, so you can compare and this ARL set is out of distribution. And if you look at GPT-4, um, you know, like you're going to see a significant drop in, um, in, in performance on things that it has not seen. So this is one example of uh, an uh, evaluation that I wanted to share that sort of highlights that second uh, weakness, which is, you know, if, if you're presenting in things that it has not seen before, and similarly getting back to, you know, businesses that are deploying this out there, you know, if you're relying on its reasoning capabilities and you're presenting with things that it has not seen before, chances are you may run into something like this. So it's good to know about it. Um, the third one I have here, I kind of really liked. It's called, are large language models really good uh, logical reasoners, uh, comprehensive evaluation and beyond? So here, they're not looking at abstract reasoning or out of distribution reasoning. They're kind of you know, stepping back and saying, okay, you know, we realize that it's not that easy to evaluate reasoning. So let's come up with a more holistic way to do it. So they construct uh, you know, basically a more intricate way to, to measure various, you know, performance aspects. Uh, now, I mentioned uh, by default, very frequently, the answer is used, you know, the answer is either right or wrong, but then, you know, there's other questions like, did it actually do the reasoning steps correctly? Um, you know, like uh, on, on the path to get, getting to the answer. So they have here in their relation, they have uh, answer correctness, explanation completeness, explanation correctness, explanation redundancy. Um, and they are scoring the models by, you know, like these six categories here is it being correct, active, rigorous, oriented, self-aware, no hallucination. So they have specific definitions for this, like correct means accuracy of answer, active means fewer or no reasoning errors, rigorous means correct answer and complete explanation, uh, oriented means correct starting point and direction for reasoning. And then self-aware, there's less redundant content um, in there. So um, like having these definitions, what they then do is they provide a visualization for the various models and the various types of reasoning. And I kind of like this because it allows you to contrast the different models in how they're performing. And you can kind of look at this and you see if you zoom in, you're going to find that, you know, you have these uh, like, uh, uh, what do you have here? Uh, correctness, no hallucination, self-aware. So all those different criteria, uh, they're outside and then uh, the, the models are depicted inside. And you can see that for, uh, you know, if you're comparing deductive reasoning and abductive reasoning, for instance, GPT behaves differently. Um, and uh, BART, for instance, for deductive and, and inductive reasoning, you can see that it is more active than any of the other models, meaning it has fewer errors, reasoning errors than chat GPT. So this is kind of, I, I thought, nice because it gives you kind of a, a, a visual uh, of, you know, the, the, the difference, uh, different strengths and weaknesses of the respective models and kind of understand that, you know, they're not doing uh, uh, equally well across these different reasoning uh, 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 tasks. So that's uh, the third evaluation approach that I wanted to share. Um, the intent here was not to sort of bring down the reasoning party, uh, but really to come at this in sort of a more measured way to, uh, you know, like, let's understand, we, we already know a lot of the accomplishments, a lot of the things that have been out there in media with, you know, BART, with, uh, with uh, the, the bar exam and whatnot. But then if you look at it in a more uh, holistic fashion, 
um, you know, like where, where are things working or are they not working? And so we've identified some gaps. Um, and when we started out, they mentioned that, you know, like these models were not trained for reasoning. And they seem like after a hundred billion parameters, they seem to be performing really well on, on reasoning benchmarks. So people started asking themselves, well, how could this be? So that's kind of how all this came about. Um, but then the question is, okay, so we, we understand, you know, kind of how they work and that they have some gaps. If we do focus on reasoning, on, on reasoning explicitly and try to, you know, infuse that capability, you know, can we do better? You know, what, how, how well can we do? How, how uh, suitable is this transformer architecture to, you know, like, be used for this purpose? Can it you know, capture more than what it's capturing right now so that we address some of these issues? So um, there is a you know, rich kind of uh, library of research on this topic, uh, and it's very, very active. Um, so one, and I'm now going to go through a couple of different methods that are used to enhance reasoning capabilities. Um, and when we're talking here about enhancing reasoning capabilities, it's really more about improving the performance. These authors don't necessarily go into the discussion of, oh, you know, like if you do this, then it's going to be reasoning like a human. Like they don't get into that. It's really more, okay, you know, like here are the ben benchmarks. Uh, how can you get, you know, better with respect to those benchmarks? Um, with you know, like being uh, no, you know, I'm not trying to to make any overly uh, strong statements about understanding what you know how, how the reasoning is actually happening. So, with uh, you know, this first approach or first few approaches I'm covering here are based on prompt engineering. And so it turns out, if you have a reasoning task and you do your prompt engineering in a specific way, you can boost your performance significantly for these reasoning tasks. And you know, this is true almost across all the different tasks. So and this one is particularly popular, it's called chain of thought prompting. Um, so if you have a somewhat of a complex question, and you know, like, you know, let's say this is your, your training data, and you know, like how you question, answer, question, answer, um, the idea of chain of thought prompting is to take the complex question and, you know, basically uh, chunk it out into more, uh, more uh, easier pieces, which you then present to the model in the context. So you kind of, you know, have a chain of, you know, step-by-step -step reasoning that uh, if you, you know, lay it out like that to the model, it actually will get the answer. So it get it gets better in getting you to, to the answer once you once you do that. Now this works works pretty well, um, and it, again this is a popular approach. The, the downside is you know you have to spend more time on you know curating these kinds of uh, you know contexts. You know breaking down your you know your more complicated uh, uh, task into subtasks that are more manageable. Um, so, you know, there's added effort there. And then there's also an added cost in the sense that you, you have to move more data back and forth if you break things down like this. So, um, let's see. So that's the first one. The second one is, uh, I'm not able to see the title here, but it's because it's the least to most, I believe is the name of this one. Um, it's also prompt based. But here, rather than the human kind of articulating the chain of, you know, like reasoning, um, here you use the large language model to decompose the more complex questions into sub pieces. Um, and then once it's decomposed, you ask the model to solve those sub, sub parts sequentially to arrive at an answer. And so Again, this is just a strategy that you can apply to any kind of reasoning uh, uh, problem. Uh, based on what the authors report here, uh, there's a significant improvement over the chain of, uh, chain of thought type of prompting. Um, so that's uh, number two. Um, there is a third type. Um, well, 
this, you know, you, you, you could, well, it, it kind of falls in a similar category, I'd say, self-refine. So what this is, is you, I mean, I mean, a lot of these conceptually are fairly straightforward. You can think of them as like, you know, easy, easy heuristics, tricks you can apply to boost your performance if you're dealing with these types of problems. With the self-refine, you, you have an input. The input goes into the model. The model generates an output. The model then is asked to provide feedback on its own output. And that then uh, is asked to use that feedback to refine the output itself. So it's kind of a, a circular loop. Uh, in this paper itself, the authors report you know, a boost in performance. But there's a study that came out later uh, from the DeepMind folks that refutes some of the usefulness of this ability to self-correct. They're saying, based on their uh, observations, that you know, if you allow this to happen, the errors kind of end up being magnified. And that large language models, at least right now, are not able to do this kind of self-correction. Um, yeah, that's a kind of a recent paper as well that came out. Moving forward, so now we've talked about things that are happening on the prompting end, which is kind of a low-hanging fruit because you know it's not that difficult to try out to implement. Um, and we have looked at the various gaps that large language models have. Um, and you know, like one of them in particular is a challenge to be faithful to reasoning, meaning to be able to articulate the various steps. Uh, and again, the faithfulness to reasoning, you know, it's like some of these methods that we just discussed, like chain of thought reasoning, they, it might help somewhat with that. Um, but you know, like not none of them are, are going to resolve the issue. Um, this uh, next two approaches is basically about taking some kind of an outside system and coupling it with the large language model. So in this particular case, they took a symbolic reasoning system. And you know, you, you get the, the large language model gets questions which are you know about reasoning. And so what it does is it formulates this in, in the reasoning, you know, in logic basically, in, in the the types of inputs that the uh, symbolic reasoner requires. So it translates English to that language, and then it feeds the symbolic reasoner. The symbolic reasoner does its thing, and then the output is then returned again to a version of a large language model that then you know tries to make interpret the output basically. And so this way, um, you know, like the the reasoning is done in a very concrete, systematic fashion. Uh, in a reliable fashion, you know, that you know, within within the symbolic reasoner. So that's one approach to um, enable faithfulness, basically, in reasoning. But it, the, what this boils down to, is, in essence, is you're not really using the reasoning capabilities, if there are any. You're not reason, using those reasoning capabilities of the large language model. You're using the large language model more as a translation uh, assistant to you know, generate code that you can feed in one system, and then you get the code out of that and interpret it, get the output rather. So that's one approach. The next one I also found interesting, it goes along similar lines. This one is called Mind's Eye. It's from the folks at Google. Um, so here, you know, like one of the challenges that large language models have, and the reasoning is they're kind of decoupled from the physical world. Like you see things around us, uh, we can use the physical world, you know, to aid our reasoning and large language models can't do that. Um, they don't have bodies yet, um, but, uh, or, or the kinds of sensors that we do. Um, so in this work, um, they took um, questions that pertain to the physical world they translate, use the large language models to translate these questions into code that is ingestible by a physics engine. And then the physics engine runs, you know, this is like a simulation, physics simulation, then, um, you know, runs the scenario. And the output of that scenario is then augmented to the input for the large language model, so that then the large language model can utilize the you know the feedback from the simulated physical world in its response so that you know you don't end up with really weird answers like i don't know apples flying you know up or usually 
it's not that extreme, but the large language models just don't, you know, like they don't have a complete picture of the world. They have some of it from, uh, you know, sentences and whatnot that are ingested, but they don't really have a model uh, like this physical uh, model in this case. So those are two examples that rely on outside systems um, to enhance the reasoning capabilities of large language models. Um, and then there's, um, there's two more that I have here, which I kind of bucketed in a similar type. Uh, and these are multi-agent systems. The first one I found kind of interesting is called multi-agent uh, debate. So here, when you have a question or an issue, you know, reasoning task, you basically let multiple agents lose and they debate, debate among each other. And it turns out once that debate, debate happens, the, the performance improves. So it, it's worthwhile to let them debate. And in particular, what I have here on the screen, I um, mean, they talk about this more in generically, like you have, you know, can have various agents, but here what they then end up doing is they, they took BART and they took ChatGTP and they let them debate. So, you know, you could literally like take, take the top three models and let them debate on, over your issues. And then, you know, whatever they agree on, you, you use as the answer. And yeah, the point here with this paper is you're going to get a boost in performance. Uh, like when it comes to uh, uh, the reasoning aspect. And then lastly, there is a, 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 an approach that also relies on multi-agent um, multi systems. Uh, here, reinforcement learning is utilized. And again, I will share the references to all of these. Um, I, I also found this interesting because here, you know, like you have a model, it goes through its steps, you know, the input and, you know, the, the very, you know, how it would break down the reasoning task. Um, and then the, the multi-agent uh, aspect of this is that the agents then, um, you know, provide uh, corrections or critiques. Uh, they critique the, uh, the output that was generated and then refinement happens. That's kind of the idea with this. Uh, and at the heart of it, they utilize the reinforcement learning. Uh, but, you know, both of them, I kind of bucketed under multi-agent systems, which I thought was an interesting approach, um, you know, to improve performance. So now we're out of, um, out of time. Uh, we've basically covered uh, a number of different methods. Um, within the audience, we have people that are not necessarily all, you know, like deeply technical. So I have kept this at a level where hopefully, uh, you know, people can absorb the information without being um, experts in the field. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, these are, you know, various um, um, efforts that represent kind of different research directions. Again, very, very active area of research. Um, I will uh, share the references and anybody that's interested can take a, a deeper dive. Um, and uh, yeah, lastly, um, as far as conclusions go, um, we've, we've already mentioned large language models are not uh, trained specifically for reasoning, and yet they seem to exhibit very interesting, you know, properties. And it's not just, you know, the the bar exam and SAT exam, it's this zero shot and few shot reasoning. You know, you ask it a question and it's able to answer. And, and that's pretty impressive. Uh, and, and it's also something that, you know, it, it, people don't necessarily are capable of articulating, um, you know, why all of that is happening. Um, so, um, you know, so that's interesting and, but, you know, even though there's these things that have been observed, there's a, um, so, uh, so there, there is a, um, there's a concern that they're not capable of abstract reasoning and that they're incapable of reasoning out of distribution. So um, that concern you can see comes from these evaluations that, you know, like the people that say this, they're not just, you know, like influencers, they're actual practitioners that will reference these types of papers that we've discussed. Um, ongoing research is focused on explicitly improving reasoning capabilities. And, um, you know, like, and as that's being done, we're no longer in a space where, you know, 
reasoning wasn't part of the equation. Now it is part of the equation because it has come to you know people's attention, and um, there are capabilities that are being developed. Uh, businesses um, should know that um, task-specific reasoning can be accomplished. So if you're thinking of deploying something, you know, like you want to make sure to stay away from generic reasoning. Uh, if you, you know, like want to be safe, uh, you know, when it comes to generic reasoning, you you need to be thread more, you know, threading more carefully, uh, especially if it's client facing, because as you have seen with some of these things that have been raised, if the model is exposed to things that it hasn't seen before, if it requires more abstract type of reasoning, it will fail. It will not work. That concludes today's session. Thank you for listening.